Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute, and the sponsor for this episode is HelloFresh. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 178 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. When we learn about early American history, most of our teachers and college professors begin with stories of Jamestown and Plymouth. They start early American history with 17th century colonial stories. But the history of early America is actually much older, even if you just stick with colonial American history. For example, one place we could start to talk about colonial American history is in 1492, when Christopher Columbus sailed west from Spain and landed on the island of Hispaniola. From Hispaniola, the Spanish went on to colonize large parts of the Caribbean, Central America, North America, and South America. Their territorial claims in the Americas was so great that Spain even had to form a special entity called the Viceroyalty of New Spain just to govern it all. Now, the territory of New Spain comprised all territory claimed by the Spanish north of the Isthmus of Panama. This included areas of Upper and Lower California, as well as large areas of the American Southwest and Southeast, including Florida. Today, we're going to take Ben Franklin's world back into the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries so we can explore some of the political, cultural, and religious history of New Spain. Specifically, we're going to explore how Spaniards and Spanish Americans used ideas about Muslims and a group of new Christian converts called Moriscos to define who could and should be able to settle and help colonize North America. Caroline Cook, the author of Forbidden Passages, Muslims and Moriscos in Colonial Spanish America, will serve as the guide for our foray into New Spain. And as we investigate who Spaniards thought could and should settle in New Spain, Caroline reveals interactions between Christians, Muslims, and Jews in Spain, who the Moriscos were and how Spaniards defined this group, and details about the everyday lives of Muslims and Moriscos in Spanish America during the 16th and 17th centuries and the challenges they face because of their religious pasts. But first, just another reminder that we're going to host a book giveaway. It'll take place the first week of April, and we have a lot of books to give away. To participate in the giveaway, you need to be a member of the Ben Franklin's World listener community on Facebook. It's free to join. Just text BFWorld to 33444 and click the link for the group in the email that I'll send you. Okay, are you ready to head into the colonial history of New Spain? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us is a lecturer in the history of the Atlantic world at Royal Holloway, University of London. Her expertise is in Iberian Atlantic history, where she focuses on interconnections between the Atlantic and Mediterranean worlds. And today, we'll explore some of those interconnections as we discuss details from her book, Forbidden Passages, Muslims and Moriscos in Colonial Spanish America. Welcome to Ben Franklin's world, Caroline Cook. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, thank you for joining us. Forbidden Passages is an interesting history that explores how the Spanish created their empire by defining the people who could be a part of that empire during the 16th and 17th centuries. It's also a history that focuses on the experiences of Muslims and Moriscos who migrated to colonial Spanish America. Caroline, we're going to talk about the history of Spanish America. But before we do, could we explore the history of Spain for a moment? Would you tell us about the history of Muslims on the Iberian Peninsula and about the religious strife that existed between Christians, Muslims, and Jews? Definitely. There's a really long and rich history of interactions between Christians, Muslims, and Jews in Iberia prior to the 15th century. Moments of not only conflict, but also of trade, of exchange. And it's really important to take into consideration the complexity, how looking back on that period, we might have either an image of very peaceful coexistence or image of violent conflict, but the reality was much more complicated. 
There were a number of Muslim kingdoms on the Iberian Peninsula from the 8th century to the last Muslim kingdom of Granada in the 15th century. And again, there were religious minorities living in each of these kingdoms, in the Christian kingdoms as well. There were Muslim and, and Jewish populations. And over the course of all of these centuries, you do see a great deal of interaction as well as moments of conflict. This changes by the time we get to the 15th century and the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabel, a growing interest in uniting the kingdoms of Aragon and Castile and a growing emphasis on Christianity. That's really interesting. So when we look at interactions between Christians, Muslims and Jews on the Iberian Peninsula between, say, the 8th and the 17th centuries, we shouldn't just see strife and conflict between them. We should also see a lot of cooperation and peaceful relationships between them. Definitely. And it is important to consider, yeah, the union of the crowns and the subsequent political decisions made by Ferdinand and Isabel in their interest in conquering Granada. This marks a major shift from the legal and religious position of religious minorities in the Christian and Muslim kingdoms. Now, your book Forbidden Passages uses a group called Moriscos as a window onto how Spaniards described and defined the different peoples they thought should be included or excluded from their empire. And I think this is a really important point to grapple with because the Spanish empire was really prominent and important during the colonial history of the Americas. So would you tell us who the Moriscos were so that we can better understand the process behind defining who could belong to the Spanish empire? So the term Morisco is a very broad term to refer to anyone who converted from Islam to Christianity, to Catholicism. But this comprised a really wide range of people from voluntary converts, several generations, and even a century prior to the 16th century, all the way to individuals who were forcibly converted to Catholicism, many of the Muslims in Granada who were forcibly baptized in 1500. So the term Morisco becomes almost a legal category by the 16th century that has a range of associations that will affect a person's place in Spanish society and in colonial society, their ability to emigrate to the Americas, for example, as Spanish authorities became increasingly concerned with tracing genealogies and lineages in order to issue licenses for people to emigrate. The Spanish Inquisition was an event that really impacted Moriscos and their ability to settle in the Americas. So would you tell us about the Spanish Inquisition and how it impacted the lives of Spanish Muslims and Moriscos? The Inquisition had a major impact on many aspects of people's daily lives, both Moriscos and also conversos, converts from Judaism to Christianity. The Inquisition was set up not to try Christians and Muslims, but anyone who converted to Christianity in order to maintain religious heterodoxy, religious uniformity in Spain and eventually in Spanish America once the tribunals were established there. And anyone who was tried by the Inquisition, this would have an impact not only on your ability to hold status in society, but on your descendants also. People who applied for important offices, posts, or who wanted to emigrate to the Americas had to prove that they didn't have an ancestor who had been convicted by the, the Inquisition. That's a really different view than I had of it. I mean, you make it sound like the Inquisition was voluntary in that conversion to Christianity wasn't mandatory unless you wanted to hold some sort of governmental office. Is that really how the Inquisition worked? So by the 16th century, even the late 15th century, there was more of a push for religious uniformity. The Jewish population was officially expelled from Iberia in 1492, the same year that the monarchs Ferdinand and Isabel conquered the last Muslim kingdom of Granada. And this is also the year that Columbus set sail for the Americas. So there's a growing concern with religious uniformity. The Inquisition itself was established a few years prior to this moment as this concern for religious uniformity was mounting, but officially it could only try converts to Christianity. Why did the Spaniards have such a desire for religious uniformity? Where did this concern come from? 
Increasingly, by the 16th century, and this continued to mount throughout the 16th century, religious identity, religious belief was being connected to political loyalty. And this had a series of sort of broader implications, Spain's diplomatic relations with the Ottoman Empire. There were periodic anxieties, fears that the Ottoman forces would invade Spain, rumors about the possibility of the Morisco population, for example, to form an alliance with the Ottomans. And even where, in many instances, these rumors were unfounded, there was a growing suspicion toward the Moriscos as potentially disloyal subjects. And this also carried into concerns over trustworthiness, trustworthiness in business relations, or in the doctors and healers who would be attending to the sick. Morisco doctors and midwives were increasingly prohibited from practicing in Spain. And this also plays out in the denunciations of Morisco healers in the Americas. I guess the Inquisition and everything around it shows just why the Spaniards had to think about their empire and who they wanted to be a part of it. Because trust was a major issue. I mean, they wanted to know that their empire would be filled with people they could trust, that their colonies in North and South America and the Caribbean had people they could trust living in them. Definitely. The terms that were being used by the first conquerors of Mexico, of Peru, they referred to themselves as Christians. There was a sense of a group identity of belonging to a Christian political community as well as a religious community. But this wasn't entirely uniform either. There was a great deal of criticism within Spain. First of all, among some priests and missionaries, the idea that with baptism, you should be able to be fully incorporated into the Christian community. This goes against some of the political imperatives of officials who sought to exclude moriscos and conversos. So this was debated throughout. Now, before we take our conversation from Spain to the Americas, I think we should talk about records. Because Forbidden Passages reflects that Caroline used a lot of records from the Inquisition to find details about the lives of Moriscos who were living in Spanish America. Caroline, would you tell us about the records the Inquisition left behind? Definitely. The Inquisition is an incredibly rich source. Thousands of letters, correspondence between Inquisitors in Spain and the tribunals in Spanish America trials also that describe religious beliefs and practices of moriscos, the practices of healers. And Inquisition records have to be read critically with a sense of the power of the institution, the interests of inquisitors. But within that, there is a lot of information that can be extracted about everyday healing practices and also the ways that moriscos are being defined and described, the anxieties surrounding them that are present in the denunciations, so it becomes possible to reconstruct some of the political world surrounding them. Okay. As we know, in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed west from Spain to find a western route to East Asia. And along his quest, he landed on the island of Hispaniola, which we know today is the Dominican Republic. From Hispaniola, the Spanish really started exploring and colonizing other areas of the Caribbean and of North and South America. Caroline, would you tell us about Spanish colonization in the Americas? What goals did the Spanish have for their territorial claims in both North and South America? Increasingly, because their claims were supported by papal bulls, the bull of Alexander VI, for example, making reference to the Spanish monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, their role in the conquest of Granada as making them the best possible candidates for spreading Christianity in the Americas. This meant that Spain's claims to the Americas were always connected with religious interests, religious imperatives, the spread of Christianity, for example. And missionaries accompanied many of the earliest voyages to the Americas. Spain's sense of its empire was very much contingent upon the conversion of indigenous peoples to Catholicism and their incorporation into the Spanish crown, even as Spaniards were building a system of extractive labor, the encomienda system, in order to extract resources and using the labor of indigenous people. 
As they tried to define who could belong to the Spanish Empire, Spaniards also considered who could help them accomplish their mission in their American colonies. Caroline, in what ways did the Spanish religious mission in the Americas impact the ability of Spanish Muslims and Moriscos to migrate and settle in the Americas? Muslims and Moriscos were officially prohibited from emigrating to Spanish America, and this is again connected to the Spanish crown's concern with its title to the Americas as connected to missionization, to the conversion of indigenous peoples. And they worried that the presence of Muslims and Moriscos might undermine the activities of missionaries, that indigenous peoples might, for example, convert to Islam instead of Christianity. So they placed ongoing restrictions through royal decrees on their presence in the Americas. So, for example, in order to emigrate, people had to obtain a license through the House of Trade in Seville. And for this, they had to summon witnesses to testify to their upstanding character, to their piety, but also trace their genealogy and prove that they didn't have any Muslim or Jewish ancestry. You make the process of migrating to Spanish America sound quite involved. So what was the lure of America that enticed Spaniards and Spanish Muslims and Moriscos to want to settle there? In many instances, the same reasons that drew old Christian families to the Americas, the desire for social mobility, a role in the initial conquest. And as news, as reports were reaching Spain from Peru, from Mexico, of the incredible wealth of the Aztec and Inca empires, this really inspired a lot of Spaniards to make the voyage over these. So you do have some moriscos at this point who join up with these expeditions, acquire high position in colonial society, and are later subject to denunciations. The Spanish crown and local Spanish-American governments may have prohibited Muslims and Moriscos from settling in Spanish America, but Muslims and Moriscos settled in Spanish America anyway. So, Caroline, how did they do it? How did Muslims and Moriscos settle in the Americas? Through a variety of means. So, on the one hand, you could pay witnesses to testify to your outstanding character, obtain false licenses through a variety of means. There were also some individuals who enlisted as sailors on ships and then jumped ship when they arrived in the Americas. And then finally, what I was going to say, not all moriscos arrived as free people. Some were enslaved following a major uprising in the Alpujarras Mountains in, in Granada in Spain. A number of the moriscos there were enslaved, both men and women, and they were taken to the Americas to labor in some of the elite households. And these licenses, again, for individual slaves to accompany their masters to the Americas, very strict terms were placed on these licenses. They might only be allowed to go to Mexico for two or three years, but then they were supposed to be sent back to Spain. And this very rarely happened. So you do have, in some instances, slaveholders being prosecuted for not sending their Morisco slaves back to Spain after the stipulated period of three years. You mentioned earlier that the Spanish desire for religious unity in Spain was great. Did the people who settled in Spanish America share this great desire for religious unity as well? I mean, did the fact that some Muslims and Moriscos overstayed their visas in Spanish America cause them problems with their neighbors? It really depended on the situation. So the Spanish crown would issue royal decrees periodically to the judges and officials of the royal courts that were eventually set up in the major cities across Spanish America, that they look for moriscos who had sort of overstayed or passed to the Americas without a license and send them back to Spain. But very often these officials look the other way. It wasn't really to their advantage or interest to send them back to Spain. And in some cases, Officials wanted moriscos to settle in the areas under their jurisdiction. There was an interest in establishing a silk industry in Mexico, for example, and the moriscos in Granada were highly skilled silk workers. So there was some interest in the skills that moriscos possessed as artisans, also as interpreters that worked to their advantage. That said, as time passed, people were aware of these broader anxieties 
surrounding moriscos and if they had any reason to sort of enter into a conflict with a neighbor or a competitor for official posts, they might denounce someone whose Morisco ancestry was well known in the community in order to try and undermine their claims to a particular post or encomiendas to and land. Wow. Morisco served as interpreters in Spanish America? I find this really curious because it seems like to be an interpreter, which likely would have involved taking the government's message and translating it so that Native Americans understood that message. Like that job would have involved a high degree of trust from the government. And I find this curious because the Spanish government is saying we trust Moriscos enough to translate our message to Native Americans, but we don't actually trust them enough to allow them to officially settle in Spanish America. Definitely. And this issue of trust resurfaces frequently. There were several cases of interpreters being denounced over this issue of trust, especially in the early expeditions, as having great skill with languages, knowing multiple languages, by it being easier for them to learn the indigenous languages, like Nahuatl. Why did Spaniards consider Moriscos to be good interpreters? I mean, why were they good at speaking and learning many languages? Especially in Granada. And some other parts of the Iberian Peninsula, many of the Muslims and Moriscos spoke local dialects of Arabic, in addition to Castilian, or they might know several of the languages spoken on the peninsula. So this, again, goes into their perception as knowing multiple languages. Would you tell us a story of a Morisco interpreter who ran into trouble in Spanish America because they were a new Christian? Definitely. There were three interpreters in Mexico who were active under the Viceroy Antonio de Mendoza. And they were, again, cast as sort of untrustworthy in a court case surrounding the official inspection of one of Mendoza's officials. And the language that's used to describe them really reflects the anxiety surrounding Morisco interpreters. This was a case where one of the officials employed under Antonio de Mendoza was being tried for corruption, and they had acted as interpreters under his watch. And they were also very much incorporated into the local society, living and working for indigenous people. And the Spanish officials represented this as being sort of very dishonorable, referring to all three of them as being the descendants of Moriscos, in one case as the son of a Morisca slave. Again, we don't know too much about them and their lives beyond this particular case. So what we have are the denunciations and the ways that people thought to be the descendants of Moriscos were cast as untrustworthy and potentially disloyal subject. Was it ever the case that someone charged someone or denounced them as being a Morisco and they were in fact, you know, an old Christian, that it was a false charge? Definitely. And in many of the cases, it also is very difficult to determine. What's interesting are the defense that people would sort of mount with their lawyers in order to make the argument that they were old Christian, or to make the argument that it didn't matter. There's the case of Diego Romero in New Granada, what's today Colombia. He was denounced in a dispute over his encomienda, or grant of indigenous tributaries. He was denounced by his rival for being a Morisco slave who had run away in New Granada and somehow acquired high status. And this attempt was to undermine his status, but Romero presents an account of his service to the crown, a very long document where he cites all of the ways that he served the Spanish king and the language that he uses. He casts himself as an honorable member of society. He says that it doesn't matter whether or not he's a morisco, but his services to the crown should prove otherwise. So what happened to Diego Romero? I mean, did his services to the crown help him fight the charges against him? He actually won his case and the charges had to be dropped. He had enough people in his community who supported him. 
This was the other issue. If your public reputation was incredibly important, and so if you could marshal witnesses to testify to your good character, then this would also have an impact in dropping charges. Okay, we need to take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor. And then we're going to ask Caroline what everyday life was like for Moriscos and Muslims in Spanish America. We've been exploring the immigration of Spanish Muslims and Moriscos to the Americas between the 1500s and 1700s. And as you may have guessed, once there was a flow of people between the Americas and Spain, there was also a flow of new and different foods, too. For example, European traders introduced sugarcane to the Americas and sent foods like vanilla pods and kidney beans back to Europe. However, the foods sailors ate on these exchange voyages was a whole other story. Their fare consisted of salted meat, olive oil, molasses, cheese, almonds, hardtack biscuits, and dry legumes, all because they could be kept stable in barrels and sometimes damp ship holds for months at a time. Fortunately, unlike early American sailors, we don't have to rely on coopers or barrel makers for the safe transport of our food, nor do we have to eat the same meals repeatedly for months at a time. With HelloFresh, we can enjoy a variety of fresh fruits and vegetables, along with meats and spices that come in just right pre-measured amounts so that we can enjoy a relaxing and delicious cooking experience. I've been a happy HelloFresh customer for about two years now, so I can tell you that HelloFresh sends me a well-insulated, fully recyclable box full of food right to my front door. That each box contains clearly labeled meal bags that contain all the ingredients I'll need to cook each meal, and easy-to-follow recipe cards that help ensure that I can cook each meal in about 30 minutes. HelloFresh does all of this for me for less than $10 a meal. You should give HelloFresh a try and see how much more fun and easy they'll make your meal times. For $30 off your first week of HelloFresh, visit HelloFresh.com and use promo code BFWORLD30. Again, that's HelloFresh.com and use promo code BFWORLD30. Caroline, during the 16th and 17th centuries, what was everyday life like for Moriscos and Muslims in Spanish America? I mean, you've told us that those who migrated faced special challenges. Were they able to find jobs and worship their religious faith either in public or quietly in their private homes? Again, really varied as much as sort of anybody's life would have varied depending on where you were living, whether it was one of the capitals of the vice royalties or in a more rural area. You have some individuals who continued to practice Islam in secret, but also there were moriscos who would have been Christians for several generations, but who had been labeled Morisco with this obsession with lineage and ancestry that was taking shape during the 16th century. So for some Moriscos also, the desire to emigrate to the Americas would have been to distance themselves from the increasing suspicion and tension in Spain, the hope that they could be fully incorporated as Christians in colonial society. So you have an entire range of beliefs and practices, an entire range of people's experience of their own identities and relationships with each other. Since experiences varied, was there a place in Spanish America known for its tolerance of Moriscos? You know, a place where Moriscos tried to settle, if at all possible? I don't think that there was necessarily an area that was seen as more accepting or tolerant. That said, in areas that were potentially farther from the more direct reach of authorities, you could potentially find the hope of being able to escape some of the surveillance. But for example, if a royal decree was issued to the judges and officials of the royal courts or the NCS, the extent to which they would have been interested in sending people to the more remote parts of the vice royalty would have been fairly unlikely. So people might have traveled to these re regions with the hope of escaping surveillance. And there was also increasing anxiety, sort of talk about the possibility for moriscos and conversos to find refuge in some of these places. You know, we've been speaking quite broadly about how Spaniards kind of feared Moriscos and Muslims. And I think it's time we look at how Spaniards use descriptions, stereotypes and ideas of Muslims and Moriscos 
to inform how they viewed who should be a member of their empire and who should be excluded from it. I mean, especially when settling in Spanish America. So, Caroline, would you tell us how the Spaniards portrayed Muslims and Moriscos during the 16th and 17th centuries? In many of the official discourses, there was a great deal of concern with the presence of Moriscos in the Americas and also tied up with Spanish anxieties about the Ottoman Empire and the potential of conflict with the Ottoman Empire. As a result, Moriscos were represented as potentially disloyal subjects, as rebellious, and their faith in Islam was also cast as a potential point of rebellion. So you have very negative representations of Moriscos on the one hand as the soil, as rebellious. And these images were, by the late 16th century, also projected onto some indigenous communities in the Americas that Spanish authorities were concerned with conquering. The stereotypes of Moriscos as being potentially violent, rebellious, disloyal subjects was also connected to arguments about enslaving them, the ability to enslave Moriscos who were officially Christians. It was not considered necessarily legal to enslave a fellow Christian, so they had to cast Moriscos as apostates and as rebellious in order to make arguments about enslaving them after this major uprising in Granada. And similarly, After the new laws in 1542, indigenous peoples were not supposed to be enslaved by the Spanish crown. And yet we know that there were raids into some of the frontier areas to take captives to enslave indigenous people, to sell them into slavery. And so the soldiers taking part in these campaigns had to use arguments, comparing them explicitly to Muslims and Moriscos in order to justify their enslavement. I do want us to explore how ideas about Moriscos and Muslims inform Spanish ideas about Native Americans. But first, if you were someone who was living in Spanish America and you've been told that Moriscos are potentially dangerous, how would you use these government descriptions of Moriscos to be on the lookout for something suspicious in your neighbors and fellow colonists? So descriptions of Moriscos, and specifically the practice of Islam, were being disseminated in local communities through officials of the Inquisition. They periodically read edicts where they described the practice of Islam, their specific view of how Islam was practiced. For example, invoking Muhammad or praying in Arabic, turning in a specific direction and kneeling while praying. All of these were preached publicly in local communities, and people were urged to denounce their neighbors if they saw anyone practicing any of these things. And so this prompted individuals in local disputes to denounce a neighbor. And this also entered into relationships between the sick and healers. I found several cases of healers who were tried for practicing Islam by the Inquisition. For example, including words in Arabic in their cures, or in one instance, saying something that was perceived to be negative about the Virgin Mary, and in one case became a sign of his being a Muslim and the ineffectiveness of his cures, but then inquisitors really seize upon this, focus on what he says about the Virgin Mary, denying her virginity. And in the printed accounts that follow his trial and execution really sort of cast him as a major heretic. So knowledge about these really negative representations of Muslims are circulating both orally through the preaching of these inquisitorial edicts to representations in in sermons where priests refer to concern of the expansion of the Ottoman Empire, all the way to the visual images of Muslims and also of Santiago, St. James, that we see in some parish churches. Santiago as the so-called Moor Slayer. He's represented on horseback as sort of conquering Muslims. 
and he is referred to as appearing at certain moments in not only conquests of Muslim communities on the Iberian Peninsula, but also the conquest in Mexico. That's really interesting because we often think of the Inquisition as being associated with Spain, not Spanish America. And yet it sounds like it spread across the entire Spanish Empire. Definitely. There were three tribunals that were established in the capitals of the viceroyalties in Lima, Peru, in Mexico City, and then a few years later in Cartagena de Indias in 1610. And these were established fairly late, the tribunals in Lima and Mexico City in about 1570. Prior to this, the bishops in the Americas had jurisdiction over trying cases of religious heterodoxy in their courts. But by the 1560s, 1570s, Spanish authorities wanted to establish Inquisition tribunals in Lima and Mexico City in order to sort of more officially process some of these cases. And you begin to run into disputes over jurisdiction between bishops who wanted to continue to maintain jurisdiction over ecclesiastical cases, cases of belief within their diocese, and the Inquisition who assumes jurisdiction over them after 1570 in these areas. But also the status of indigenous people who were never subject to the Inquisition. They remained under the jurisdiction of the bishop following baptism. Their religious faith was what was questioned. Speaking of Native Americans, you mentioned earlier that Spaniards used ideas and descriptions about Muslims and Moriscos to inform how they portrayed and thought about Native Americans. Would you tell us more specifically how ideas of Muslims and Moriscos influence Spanish and Spanish-American views of Native Americans? Many of the comparisons between indigenous peoples and Moriscos and Muslims were in the context of campaigns to expand into frontier areas and also enslaved indigenous peoples who resisted Spanish encroachment. And many of these representations of Muslims as rebels, as apostates, as people who rejected Christianity, were then mapped onto these indigenous communities in order to justify their enslavement. You know, earlier we were talking about the fact that if you get accused of being a Morisco in Spanish America, you had to go before an inquisitorial board and answer the charge. Did Native Americans, who were often thought of as being very similar to Moriscos, have the same opportunities to appear before inquisitorial boards to answer charges of apostasy after conversion? Or was there perhaps another judicial or religious body that they appeared before when this happened? So indigenous peoples were officially not subject to the Inquisition, but they could be tried by local bishops for maintaining their older beliefs and practices. And so you do have cases of individuals, a great deal of anxiety in the Andes, for example, by the late 17th, early 18th centuries with idolatry, idolatry trials, where religious authorities were concerned with maintenance of older beliefs. By the end of the 17th century, when Spaniards had about 200 years worth of colonial experience, did the Spanish reach any sort of resolution on who they wanted as members of their empire? And did Native Americans, Moriscos, and Muslims ever fit within their vision of their empire and nation? So this concern with genealogy and blood purity persists into the late 17th century. And that's part of one of my next projects where I'm interested in sort of how these dynamics continue, how representations of Muslims and Islam continue to play a role in the arguments made by the colonial elite to continue to hold status in colonial society, to make claims to forming part of a nobility. But in terms of the degree to which the royal decrees were being issued, it seems like they sort of drop off after the early 17th century. I haven't noticed sort of the same intensity and preoccupation of issuing royal decrees for officials to search for Moriscos in their midst after the reign of Philip III and after the expulsion of the Moriscos from Spain. Caroline, 
Why do you think understanding how Spaniards define Muslims, Moriscos, and Native Americans in the 16th and 17th centuries is important? How does understanding these definitions and the thought process that went into developing them help us better understand the development of the Spanish Empire and of early American history? It really connects to this question of representations of Muslims and Islam to Islamophobia also that's still very relevant today, how negative representations of Muslims have a long history playing out in terms of anxieties about immigration, anxieties about belonging, belonging to a particular community, in this particular case, the Spanish Empire, but that has resonance in other places and and time periods. Also, the growing concern with constructing a nation that was different from earlier centuries by the late 16th century. Definitions of nation as being very much connected to religious identity as Catholic, not only in the context of conflict with the Ottoman Empire, but also the Protestant Reformation and drawing boundaries between religious communities in defining nation. And finally, this concern with ancestry, with with purity of blood. We can trace the early roots of racism to this moment where religious belief, religious identity is increasingly being viewed as hereditary. And this begins to inform later ideas about race as they emerge and harden by the late 18th century. Now it's time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if Spain had allowed Moriscos and Muslims to settle in Spanish America without any restrictions? How would the history of early America have been different? So that is a huge question. And there are a couple of ways that I could potentially speculate as to how Spanish American history would have been different. I might say that we would see a larger Muslim population in Latin America that dates back to a much earlier period that has a much longer history if people didn't have to hide their beliefs. But that said, it's important to recognize that Moriscos comprised a really wide range of people, many of whom identified as Christians, even as their grandparents might have been Muslim. So it's sort of hard to say whether or not there would have been a more visible Muslim population. Spanish authorities might have also allowed for larger groups of moriscos to arrive and settle, potentially the groups of artisans whose skills they valued. So there was, as I mentioned, the major silk industry in Granada. Moriscos played a very important role in the production of silk. And the Spanish authorities hoped to establish a silk industry in Mexico to train indigenous people to spin silk and raise silkworms. So perhaps we might see a silk industry emerging in Mexico more prominently than the few attempts that were made. But again, it's really hard to, <laughs> to speculate. Earlier, you started to tell us about your new project. Would you tell us more about it? I'm working on a couple of new projects. The one that looks at the um, representations of Muslims and Moriscos by the 17th and early 18th centuries, the role that these representations play in family histories, the production of histories by elite families that attempted to stake claim to noble status in the Americas. But I've also started work on a micro history. I found a case of a North African slave who denounced himself to the Inquisition in Seville, Barcelona, and Mexico City. And I have thousands of pages of documents spanning a 30-year period where he enters into debates with inquisitors about the nature of the Eucharist, the role of the priest during Mass. He has a number of conversations about Islam and Christianity and his concern with salvation 
And he also, through each of these trials, he actually denounces himself. He's not denounced by others. He is attempting to negotiate his status as a galley slave to be removed from the galleys. And each time he denounces himself, the inquisitors put him to work listening to his appeal to practice his profession as a cook in a hospital or a monastery. He runs away, is re-enslaved, denounces himself again. So I'm really interested in comparing his testimonies, looking at issues of self-presentation in the face of powerful institutions like the Inquisition, the degrees of agency that individuals could have, and the ways that he tells his life story in each of these trials, issues of testimony and self-presentation. How can we contact you if we have questions about Muslims and Moriscos in early Spanish America? My website at Royal Holloway University of London has all of my contact information and a list of publications and the courses I teach also. I would definitely welcome questions. Caroline Cook, thank you for taking us into Spanish America and for giving us ideas about what life was like for the Muslims and Moriscos who lived there. Thank you so much for inviting me. Prior to the 15th century, Spain had a long, rich history of mostly peaceful interactions between the Christians, Muslims, and Jews who lived in Iberia. It was the marriage of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella that changed the nature of those relations. Upon uniting their Iberian kingdoms of Aragon and Castile through marriage, Ferdinand, Isabella, and their subjects became increasingly concerned with achieving religious uniformity across the Iberian Peninsula and after 1492 in its American colonies as well. Now, to achieve this religious uniformity, the monarchs established the Tribunal of the Holy Office of the Inquisition, or the Spanish Inquisition, in 1478. The purpose of the Spanish Inquisition was to make sure that people who had converted to Catholicism, forcibly or otherwise, had truly converted. But the Spanish Inquisition just wasn't enough to achieve the level of religious uniformity the Spaniards sought. So in 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella expelled practicing Jews from their kingdoms, while their army finished its conquest of the last Muslim kingdom in Iberia, Grenada. Now, with its plans to achieve religious uniformity throughout the Iberian Peninsula well underway, Spaniards began thinking about how to create and enforce religious uniformity in Spain's American colonies as well. As Caroline revealed, religion and ideas about religion constituted an important part about how Spaniards thought about who should belong to their empire, and who should be able to settle in their colonies. Spaniards considered whether Muslims and Moriscos, those men and women who had either converted from Islam to Catholicism, or who had been born into families who had converted less than a century before, Spaniards thought about and considered whether these people should be able to settle in North America. Oftentimes, the answer was no. However, as we just discovered, sometimes the answer was yes. Sometimes the Spanish government granted permission for Morisco servants and slaves to accompany their masters and temporarily settle in New Spain. Other times, the Spanish government seems to have permitted those with excellent language skills to migrate to New Spain, provided that they serve as interpreters. But for those Muslims and Moriscos who really wanted to migrate to New Spain, you know, so that they could take advantage of all the opportunities it afforded, well, sometimes Muslims and Moriscos said yes when the Spanish government said no and they found their own extra-legal ways to get to New Spain. Now, the concern over Muslims and Moriscos settling in the Americas opens a window onto the anxieties about who the Spanish thought could make industrious and trustworthy colonists. Colonists who could ultimately help Spain secure American lands for its empire. Plus, this concern over Muslims and Moriscos also shows us how Spaniards thought about the new indigenous peoples they encountered. Could new indigenous converts to Christianity be members of the Spanish Empire? Could they really become trustworthy subjects and colonists? Spaniards just couldn't help but think about Moriscos when they tried to answer these questions. As Caroline noted, thinking about how early modern Europeans and Euro-Americans thought about who could join their emerging nation-states and empires is really important. It helps us gain a different dimension on how they viewed their American colonies and colonists. And, It helps us see that over 500 years later, we still think in similar ways about many of the same issues of belonging and who can belong to our particular states and communities. Look for more information about Caroline, her book Forbidden Passages, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 178. Thanks to HelloFresh, you don't have to eat like an early American sailor. 
HelloFresh will allow you to enjoy all sorts of fresh food offerings with great recipes that you can prepare in just about 30 minutes. So give HelloFresh a try by visiting HelloFresh.com and using promo code BFWORLD30. Finally, what other aspects of Spanish American history would you like to explore as we continue our quest to learn more about our early American past? I always love to receive topic requests, so please share your ideas with me via email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.